Well, welcome everybody to iFilm Dailies. I'm your host, Marcelo Lewin. And in our episode today, Introduction to Streaming Live Events, presented by Andy Beach, you will learn lots of tips and tricks you'll need to get started with live streaming. Your presenter today is Andy Beach. Andy is recognized as a respected industry voice. He founded The Video Uprising, where he tracks and comments on trends in over-the-top video distribution and has contributed articles to popular industry media outlets like Fierce Online Video. Andy has authored a really great book called Real World Video Compression, which explains the world of video in plain English. In 2011, Andy was named to Streaming Media's All-Star List and led his former company to its first Red Herring Top 100 North America Award. Having worked with industry giants like Microsoft, Apple, and Adobe, Andy brings significant experience in the online video industry. You can learn more about him at techgeist.com. I'm your host, Marcelo Lewin. I'm also the founder of iFilm Dailies. If you would like to learn more about me, just visit ifilmdailies.com or email me, marcelo, at ifilmdailies.com. Finally, we would like to thank our sponsors, since it is thanks to them that we are able to offer these shows to you for free. So thank you to Telestream for sponsoring our show and for providing a full version of Wirecast Pro to give away as a prize today. Telestream specializes in products that make it possible to get video content to any audience, regardless of how it is created, distributed, or viewed. You can find out more about Telestream at telestream.net. So before we jump into live streaming topic, it would be great to sort of just level set on the different types of live streams that are out there, Uh, because there's actually a lot of different type of live streaming that you that you might be doing. Uh, The the most simple and sort of uh, sort of exactly what we're experiencing right now is is a webcast or a screencast uh, where you're literally just taking a uh, an audio feed and some sort of uh, uh, computer screen and encoding that and delivering it to to an audience. Sort of a level up from there would be a a single camera production. Uh, No switching, just a a camera plugged directly into some type of encoder delivering a a feed out to to your audience. Uh, Moving up from there though, uh, we start getting into a a little more sophisticated multi-camera production where uh, a switcher most likely is involved, uh, multiple audio sources, multiple video sources, likely mixing in graphics and broadcasts as well, uh, which is probably what a lot of you are, are uh, aiming to do in the long run. The last type is something that you're you're most likely not doing as an audience, but it's, it's something to be aware of and certainly part of the mix. It's what we call uh, in the industry a live linear stream. And this is sort of exactly what we were talking about with uh, broadcast cable. Uh, cable is a, is a linear stream. Uh, all of it is on-demand, or most of it is on-demand content mixed in with some live programming that's delivered over a broadcast channel. In Live Linear, we're getting the, the that same live stream, but it's delivered over over an IP stream. So you're starting to see a lot of this show up on, in a variety of devices, uh, Xbox and iPhone. Uh, certain cable providers uh, have the ability to watch a Live Linear stream there. That's slightly different. That tends to be something uh, that you know a cable service provider is, is doing, and, and not something that um, sort of a smaller production company tends to do. You guys are more focused on most likely the multi-camera and, and switcher environments. What does a live streaming workflow look like? So all of the all of these key areas are some are something that we're going to go over and talk about sort of the general uh, capabilities of but generally speaking you've got a source that you're going to capture into an encoding device you're going to ideally be writing that locally then you're also going to be uh, broadcasting it out to the internet in some method that's going to be going either to a streaming server some sort of service or a CDN a content delivery network that content delivery network or streaming service or server is a way of hosting that content and then making it shareable to a wider audience on the variety of devices. And there's a lot of different things that could be going on at that that live streaming location, whether it's repackaging of the content, re-encoding of the content to multiple bit rates and uh, multiple formats, and generally caching it out uh, to, to a wider audience so that as many people can see it as possible.
So let's start with some of the basics at, at each of those steps. Uh, for your video source, uh, obviously I, I said this in the pre-final show, but for those who, who uh, hadn't joined yet, to me one of the most fundamental mistakes that I see made is that someone tries to do a live stream, they do a great job with their servers and their encode settings, everything's great, but then they have a, a crappy video image uh, or poor audio quality, and that just ruins the entire experience. If you don't have a good quality source, uh, you're not going to have a good quality production, and that, that's really what it comes down to. So uh, making sure that you have a decent camera, ideally a three-chip camera, uh, because there you're, uh, you're separating out and uh, providing sort of the most fidelity to the, uh, to the color signal and the light signal uh, on the video, so that when you encode it, you have more information to work with. Uh, and then the audio, you absolutely do not forget about the audio as, as part of this process. Uh, there's often a desire, you know, if you're, if you're looking to cut corners, some people will try to uh, just use the, the onboard uh, camera microphones. Those tend to be very noisy microphones that pick up a lot of information, uh, a lot of uh, external information that you don't want to get. Um, if they're Depending on where they are on the camera, on the make and model, it'll actually pick up a lot of the, the noise of the camera itself as you're touching it or moving it, uh, but also just the, the, the motor that's, that's operating the camera. So you really want to break that out and you want to have an external audio mic, uh, and you really want to be using multiple mics if you're trying to create a true experience. You want a shotgun mic getting background noise, and then you want either a handheld or a lavalier mic on whoever's speaking and you're mixing those two to get a good balance so that you have a really good experience for, for the end user that's viewing it. So capturing that content. Uh, so you've got good audio, you've got good video, you now need to get it into the computer so that you can do something with it. Uh, you're either going to be moving it into some sort of video switcher where you're going to be plugging multiple uh, sources together or perhaps plugging it directly in via a capture card into uh, your computer so that so that you can uh, do the actual encode. If you're going through a, a switcher, most likely you're going to have multiple sources uh, of independent audio and video and you're going to be making uh, decisions about how to, how to select and, and create ultimately a single program stream or a broadcast, which is the thing that you're ultimately going to encode. So for the actual encoding, there's really sort of two different paths that, that you can pick, and this starts to come down to the type of uh, the type of program you're doing and the and the type of uh, sort of uh, production workflow that you have. If you're a relatively small production uh, that's delivering to a, a relatively small audience, you may actually be encoding the final delivery right on site. And what I mean by that is that you know if you're showing to sort of a less than 100 people, maybe less than 500 people, then on site you very possibly could just be delivering the, uh, you're encoding that program stream to the final bit rates that you're delivering to the end users. And those are going to be broadcast into your, your streaming server or what have you. Now the, the so the, the positives with that is that you're going to be saving money upstream, meaning that your your streaming server doesn't have to do as much. It's just sort of hosting the content for you to deliver out to the end users. The downside of that is that you need to make sure you have a really uh, big uh, uh, upload pipe for, uh, connectivity from your location to the internet to where you're ultimately streaming that content. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into some uh, streaming settings uh, and where you want to be hitting, but that may not be ideal. Uh, you know, we were just talking about in the in the pre-show, we were talking about that notion of streaming over a mobile broadband connection. That's not practical if you're if you if you want to do sort of three or four bit rates uh, to deliver. That quickly adds up to uh, sort of a great deal of of content that you may be trying to uh, push into the network at one time. So it may be more practical, rather than trying to do all of your bit rates and all of your settings sort of on location and then push it to the cloud, is to actually encode what in the industry we would refer to as a mezzanine file or sort of a single high bit rate file that's your effectively your new source. So you're taking that broadcast, you're creating sort of a high bit rate source that's sort of your just top end encode, 
and you deliver that to your service, your CDN, or your server, and let it then do the work of repackaging and re-encoding it into the multiple formats that would then host out to all the variety of, of end users. So that's going to have some benefit because it, it means that you don't have to have as big a pipe connecting you to the internet. Uh, less chances to fail. It also means, means, frankly, that you don't have to have as much horsepower on site with you uh, at your location. So in other words, if you're not trying to encode four, three or four bit rates simultaneously, that's going to take up more uh, CPU resource than it would be to try and encode a single high bit rate, uh, high quality file. So I talked about uh, connectivity. Uh, this is going to be one of those sort of crucial bottlenecks in, in your production workflow. Uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, when you're when you're on a location, you never want to max out your bandwidth by more than about half uh, of the, the available bit rate. So I think we all know how to do sort of a, a streaming bit rate test, but if you don't, you know, there's a lot of sites out there where you can go check your, your bandwidth connection. You want to check that multiple times from the location you're at. And based on the results that you're seeing, that was going to help tell you by about how much you you can actually uh, encode and expect to deliver. So if I go to a location to, and start testing and I'm only getting about sort of a three megabit connection, that tells me that realistically I'm only going to be able to reliably provide about a meg and a half uh, upload bandwidth capability. Um, so I would want to target my, my video encode settings to, to only deliver approximately that. You also want to make sure that you're on a relatively dedicated bandwidth or, or dedicated connection to the to the network. You don't really want to be sharing this with a lot of people. Uh, sometimes it's completely uh, unavoidable uh, that there's at least a few computers on it, but for sure you don't want to be sharing it with the, the public at large. Uh, you do, would not, for example, go to a conference center and try uh, expect to get a good quality stream over Wi-Fi that was hosting several hundred cell phones and other connected devices with it. Um, because the reality is that every time someone tries to uh, uh, use that network, it's going to degrade the quality of the upload that, that you're getting, and it's going to drop, and it's going to be very uh, sort of spiky and unreliable. So uh, for an HD stream, uh, you want to you wanna get really about a 4 megabit connection. Uh, for an SD stream, you could you could afford to do about a, a meg and a half. Um, if you if you sort of have those as general targets, uh, that means of course that for your SD stream, you know you would be maxing out at around 700 or 800 kilobits per second, and for that HD stream, you'd, it would allow you to go up to about two megabit per second. So this is the point where we've actually made it into the into the network, into the cloud, uh, for, for the streaming. As I mentioned, there's sort of three different ways uh, that you could uh, approach uh, delivering the content. You could set up your own server. Uh, you know, Wowza is a very popular one uh, for, for doing uh, streaming hosting. I, I sort of caution people who are just starting out from, from going down that route immediately because it, it'll seem like a cost saver because, you know, it's a relatively inexpensive way to sort of get up and running. But at the same time, unless you're a, an expert on setting up and maintaining a streaming server, it may not be where you really want to invest your time. Uh, so instead, it's, it's, I think it's really worth looking at all the streaming solutions that are out there. A lot of places have these sort of turnkey streaming accounts uh, that you can go on and set up for relatively low money starting out, uh, and then you, you sort of pay per minute of processed video. And that typically means the, you know, the number of minutes of encoded video out plus the plus the number of minutes of uh, video uh, coming into the system uh, will tell you how much you're sort of paying priced per minute. And here's just an example of a, of a couple of the, uh, the ones out there. There's actually a, a, a larger, even larger uh, list uh, than this in a, a link that I'll show you here in, in just a little bit. But they're, you know, literally a variety of places, and some of them, like I said, they do have sort of free or low-priced ways to get, at least get started with this. They may have a uh, some sort of ad or 
uh, advertising for themselves or branding that comes with it, which you can then typically unlock by going into their sort of pro or advanced user uh, area where you're, you're paying a little more money per month, but then you're getting to sort of brand it as, as your own. These tend to be, I think, real time savers, and they're a good way for people who are particularly just starting out uh, and want to get a live stream because you're not really having to worry about setting up and maintaining your own server. You may get to a point where where you grow beyond this, um, but I think this is really an ideal way to, to start out uh, and let you focus in on the, the production, which again, as I mentioned earlier, I think is the more important area for you to focus on. So uh, in this area, it's really just about sort of learning some of the terminology. And I've actually set these slides up. I'm not going to go over each of these in detail because it, it tends to, it turns into a word salad. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you just had sort of a, a good basis of several of the different terminology that you're going to run into, uh, either from the encoding side, the networking side, and others. And you'll actually have these uh, slides available as a PDF uh, for download later. So I'm not, again, I'm not going to sort of uh, belabor and sort of read these all line by line. That would be a terribly boring webinar. On the encoding side, there's really two different, uh, in compression in general, there, there's two different types of encoding we do. We do uh, CBR, constant bit rate. We do VBR, variable bit rate. Uh, variable bit rate ten is, uh, well, constant bit rate, I, almost obvious where uh, the the same amount of bits are constantly used to encode the content, regardless of what the, the video image looks like. So if you're setting your your uh, your target bit rate at 700 kilobits per second, doesn't matter what the scene change looks like, it's always going to be using about 700K in order to paint that image. VBR, or variable bit rate, allows you to actually set a target and then a peak, meaning that it's always going to try and average this, but if the scene suddenly gets very aggressive or very hard to encode, it's going to jump up and use that, that higher bit rate, and you're allowing it to vary based on what the, what the image is. Uh, while you can do live streaming over VBR, it's, it's actually much harder for certain devices to try and play that back. So uh, to optimize your stream for the sort of the widest audience, I really would suggest sticking with uh, CBR or constant bit rate uh, when, you're, when you're doing your live streaming. Uh, you're going to see much better results. Uh, when you get into on-demand, that's where you start playing more with your, with your VBR settings. Uh, streaming, we've got uh, two different really methods that, that we talk about being able to stream. We've got a push and a pull. And this is really the way that the encoder connects with the, that media server that's hosting the content that everybody's connecting to. In a push scenario, the encoder is literally pushing a constant stream of, of video out to that uh, server, so effectively it's broadcasting it out to it. And typically it requires some sort of authentication into that system. A pull is the total reverse. Uh, it's just writing content to its hard drive somewhere in, in some sort of buffer. And then the media server is actually trying to pull the content from that, that buffer uh, into the system. Latency refers to the amount of time from uh, that it takes to actually deliver the content uh, and sort of that lag time between live. Uh, even though this is live that we're delivering, we're there's going to be a, a slight delay from, from the signal being encoded to it actually being delivered to the end user. And it's really going to vary depending on the services that you're using. Obviously, everybody wants to optimize it down uh, as low as possible. Um, but the reality is you're going to carry somewhere between probably at least a uh, 5 or 10 second on the low side, as much as potentially 30 second on the high side uh, latency in your live streaming content. And then uh, these last two are protocols that, that are very common, uh, and you'll hear these uh, sort of three-letter acronyms bandied about quite a bit. ABR is Adaptive Bitrate Video Streaming. This is the protocol that was developed by Apple uh, a number of years ago and is uh, made popular, very popular by the iPhone uh, and delivers to all iOS devices. Uh, you'll also hear uh, it referred to as HLS, HTTP Live Streaming. Uh, ABR is sort of the, uh, the, the generic uh, name for it. Um, it also covers smooth streaming by Microsoft, and then the uh, H, I believe it's HDP, uh, dynamic streaming from Flash. And then we have RTMP, real-time media protocol, that was developed uh, as one of the uh, original sort of IP streaming options out of uh, Macromedia, later acquired by Adobe, and is, uh, was 
as sort of the backbone of video streaming, uh, live video streaming for Flash. Uh, within one of the things that always becomes a, a little tricky when you're setting up a live stream and is that you have to become sort of an expert on firewalls and and networking as well. Uh, you have to make sure that you'll you'll get very used to looking uh, for things like ports and port forwarding when you're on a location. You want to make sure that there's actually a way through the the router firewall that you're dealing with to, to actually connect to the uh, server that you're trying to hit. Um, so just be aware and, and sort of be conscious of, of knowing some IT terminology and being comfortable uh, looking into routers to make sure that your your ports are set up in such a way that you're actually allowed to uh, deliver content through it. All routers are generally sort of set up to make sure you can deliver over port 80, uh, just regular HTTP, uh, which is part of the reason that uh, adaptive bitrate has become so popular. Less uh, uh, they're less set up and optimized for things like RTMP streaming, and so sometimes it'll take a little bit of extra work to make sure those are, are actually available for you to use. Uh, this was a great sort of just general description of the different connectivity types you're going to run into. I think wired and wireless are, are quite obvious. I'm not going to, uh, again, sort of belabor those. Um, obviously, it's, it's always most optimal uh, if you can be connected via a, an Ethernet connection from your encoder to the uh, to the router that you're actually uh, connecting to the internet on. But particularly in uh, either portable scenarios or, or others, it, it, you may actually be trying to do something over, over mobile. Again, in the pre-show, we talked about the abilities to, to do some uh, streaming over LTE or 4G. The reality is, though, that if, if you're in an area where there's high activity and a lot of uh, users on that um, on that data platform, uh, it may you know it may be great when you start out, and then you know a, a thousand people go to check their email, and all of a sudden you're you're out of uh, you're out of bandwidth and connectivity because it, you're having to share the, the network with a lot of people. What is uh, uh, what a lot of professional uh, streaming companies are, are starting to use are what are called these bonded cellular connections. Teradek is a is sort of an example of this. And that's where you take not a single uh, sort of LTE modem or, or 4G modem, but you actually take multiple ones, as, as many as uh, five or six at a time, and you bond them together to create uh, a much larger streaming solution. So instead of having the power of sort of an individual uh, uh, 4G modem, you're, you're combining uh, four or more together to create uh, a much better broadband uh, signal. Uh, and those are those actually work fairly well. Again, they, they still fall down in places like uh, you know, conferences or other places, other locations where you may not have a super great signal, uh, or you're in a highly congested area where network traffic suddenly spikes dramatically. Uh, so there's really sort of moving into the sort of the encoder side of this. We've got sort of three different encoders that uh, I want to talk about. Uh, we've got the, and these are generally how you'll see them referred to in the industry, and uh, so it's a it's a good way to just sort of uh, start thinking in terms of, of what they are and, and how they work, operate. We've got hardware encoders, we've got software encoders, and then we've got what I would call either an appliance or a turnkey encoder. Which is really just a hybrid of the uh, of the two. So a hardware encoder is really a purpose-built device. Um, it's typically you're taking a code technology and you're baking it right into a hardware solution to the point that it's going to do one function and and probably really little else, but it'll do it extremely well, extremely fast, uh, and because you've got it down to this component section, you can really kind of mass produce it. Uh, so these tend to be fairly uh, cheap solutions at the end of the day. I mean, they still tend to run somewhere between a hundred bucks and a few thousand uh, bucks, but they're literally very purpose-built. I don't actually consider true hardware solutions that practical for a live streaming event. Uh, these are much more like, uh, you know, they're, they're either, if they are, they're like high-end uh, sort of production capture cards that you're bundling with another piece of software in order to actually 
do uh, a stream out or it's something like the security cams uh, that, that you see here that do do streaming but they're really divine, des designed more for you know, security and monitoring they're not to create sort of a programmatic broadcast um, that, that we would go uh, attend or join in some way. So these aren't quite what we're looking for when we when we think about a uh, uh, a live streaming event. Then you've got software. Software is you set it up and just run it on your existing hardware. It's highly flexible, uh, giving you a lot of room to do configurations and throughput. You can you know change and tweak the settings. Um, you can usually get it at a at a pretty good low price point. I mean these these tend in the encoding world. Um, you know I know. Uh, you know, five hundred dollars. It may not be uh, sound cheap to everybody, but when you're talking about solutions that can run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's actually you know really inexpensive and a, and a great easy way to get sort of started. The one downside, and the one thing you really have to be conscious of, though, is that your performance is going to vary based on your configurations. And so, whatever you're installing the software on, uh, you're going to be gated by whatever what other whatever other applications are running on the device and then just the, the processor and memory capabilities of, of the, the CPU itself. So, you know, you can't really, you can't assume that uh, you're going to install it on just any old device and have it run uh, and do, you know, HD or 100 streams at once or, or whatever else. So that's where we kind of get into this blend of the two, which would be a, either an appliance or a, or a turnkey. And that's where you're taking sort of the flexibility of a software system, but you're installing it or, or you're, you're running it on a set piece of hardware. So basically a purpose-built piece of hardware, uh, which really could just be a server or a, a CPU, but it's been optimized for delivering uh, uh, live streaming content and encoding. And there's really sort of two different ways to, to look at it. There, there literally are these uh, sort of appliances, which typically are servers, such as the, the digital rapid server that we're, we're looking at here. That's really technically just a computer, um, but it's a computer that's been built from the ground up to be a encoding appliance uh, and running a customized version uh, of software that they built for that system, and in the HD realm, those could those could run anywhere from sort of fifteen thousand dollars to thirty or forty thousand dollars, depending on on what you're trying to do with it. The other side of that coin is is sort of what I would consider more turnkey solutions, and and turnkey solutions are. Uh, are put together sometimes by aftermarket or sometimes multiple technology partners where they'll take uh, software that can be sold off the shelf but you're combining it with a uh, some sort of computing system and maybe some capture cards or something else to create a system that's ready to go. So you could go build this configuration yourself if you wanted to but it's usually just about the same price to to uh, to just buy it from them as a as an off-the-shelf solution. Those tend to be a, a little less expensive. They they run somewhere between you know, maybe thirty five hundred dollars and, and probably ten grand at the at the most expensive. And I actually think these are also a great option for for someone that's uh, just getting started in the market. So. Uh, a couple streaming uh, considerations before we, we jump out of sort of the encoding side of the things. Uh, I mentioned this notion of, of a mezzanine stream. Uh, I think this really is sort of the, the best solution if you're if you're getting started out. Uh, I think there there is this desire or there, there's this sort of, I've, I've heard a lot of people who are getting started in this world talk about the notion that they're going to do all their encoding and then they're going to deliver it up to like a Wowza server or something like that uh, for, for delivery uh, out to, to a, a wider audience. Again, the, the practicalities of that is, you know, unless you control the the the, the, the broadband pipeline that you've got going to the uh, to that server, you may not get the, the results you're looking for. And so, rather than try to do all your encoding locally and and deliver it to the cloud, I think it's better to focus on getting a really good high bit rate mezzanine stream out. Uh, and pump that to a service or a server online and then let that server be configured to do some re-encoding and repackaging to get to all the various devices that you want to hit. Uh, if you're looking to do as many devices as possible, uh, you do want to investigate and explore how to do uh, some sort of adaptive bitrate. 
because that really is going to be the way that you get to all those iOS devices, Android devices, uh, and what have you. Uh, that'll that'll sort of give you the, the wide audience that you want. But those tend to also be, be those tend to also be slightly more specialized encoders. Um, much more likely that you find a uh, uh, a flash streaming solution, R an RTMP stre streaming solution that you can use to broadcast that RTMP RTMP stream into the cloud and then have it be repackaged or encoded into the, the ABR that you're looking to do. And all, virtually all those services that I I'd mentioned earlier, all of them have capabilities to, to repackage for at minimum iPhone, but often iPhone and Android and, and other devices. Uh, H.264 is, is really the, the codec you're looking at today. Um, you know, again, we mentioned H.265 earlier. There's things like VP9 out there uh, coming from, that's an open source that comes from uh, Google and, and YouTube. Those still tend to be slightly smaller audiences, and all the devices that would play back that VP9 stream uh, are most likely also H.264 clients. So I think really focusing on just using the H.264 codec is going to get you your largest audience. But you really need to look at and investigate what your connectivity to the cloud is going to be able to support and ultimately what your audiences can consume. And that's going to help you dictate the actual types of settings that you want to put together in order to create the experience for your users. Uh, one last sort of thought that I, I had had here, and I, I didn't have uh, more information on the production, uh, otherwise I would have thrown it in here, but when you're encoding content, handheld content tends to be the hardest to encode because the every pixel on the screen is sort of constantly in a state of motion because it's hard to keep a perfectly still. So there's always going to be a little bit of, of motion to the camera. That tends to be very hard to encode. So you spend, uh, you're, you're wasting a lot of bits just trying to keep the image stable or, or under control that could be used to, to actually make a higher quality uh, image for the end user. So when at all possible uh, in your production, make sure that your your camera's locked down uh, on a tripod or some sort of, you know, uh, restrict the motion to as, as little as possible. And when you have to move the camera, make it meaningful, you know, make it a pan or a tilt, not just a, a sort of a fast sort of handheld uh, motion of some sort. Uh, so as you want, you know, as you're looking at the the bit rates, because um, I knew that I would uh, I would catch all kinds of grief if I uh, got out of this uh, webinar without giving you at least some notion of the the sort of target bit rates that you should be looking at. Because a lot of the work I do, we tend to be thinking about, about adaptive bit rate solutions, delivering multiple uh, video streams to to someone. Uh, I wanted to put those up, but I also want to call out you know that notion of the mezzanine file. Uh, so if I were only creating a single file um, on site somewhere, I would probably really focus on doing a 720p, 2.5 megabit, or 2,500 kilobit uh, stream. But then at the uh, at the cloud where I was repackaging and re-encoding this, I would try to probably create at least you know uh, four or five of these other streams uh, uh, under them, depending on. Uh, again, sort of what my end users were, were trying to consume the content on. If I were very heavily focused on desktop and sort of set-top box environments, I'd probably focus more on the, the higher end of this. But if I were trying to get uh, folks on iPhones and Android uh, devices as well to be watching it, then I would need to make sure I included at least one or two uh, of the lower uh, data rates as well and the lower screen resolution sizes. So I did a sort of just a quick uh, dream shopping list. If I were going to be building my own sort of starter live studio solution, I, I went to Amazon and said, you know, what would I really want uh, in terms of throwing together everything in a backpack that I might need to, to do uh, to do a stream? And again, I sort of focused here on just a, a single uh, a single camera type solution. Obviously, you could you could really go nuts if you have a multi camera. Uh, solution uh, that's set up, but if I if I just wanted a basic sort of single camera streaming kit that I had put together, it's probably a laptop, uh, some sort of rated drive just to make sure that I have additional uh, capture and storage point, decent lights, decent mic, uh, a camera. Here I happen to pick a, 
a uh, pretty good looking uh, HDV camera. Uh, and I went with the with the Wirestream solution because I, again, really for for a starter kit, there, there's probably not a lot. Uh, there's not a lot of others that'll have the flexibility that you're you're kind of looking for, and you know, price tag wise, that that sort of brought me down. That put me in sort of the the five ish thousand dollar mark, which again for a for a starter kit uh, doing a live stream, I think that's actually a, a pretty good uh, starting point, and you know, pretty good expectation. If you could probably cut some corners and do it for a little cheaper, but I think you'd be kind of hard pressed to to do it for for any cheaper than this realistically. Um, we talked about those turnkey solutions earlier, and I did want to mention that um, that there's a sort of a great collection of turnkeys at uh, Telestream's website. They've partnered with Matrox uh, for their uh, VS4 systems. And basically, it's a bundle of the, the VS4 with Wirecast on, again, those sort of purpose-built CPUs, and they kind of come in a lot of configurations. Uh, some are these, like, portable uh, sort of uh, ruggedized, almost laptop-looking systems with a with a fold down. Some are really more of like a shoebox type encoding deck. So it's really there's sort of a wide range of depending on what, what you're trying to do uh, for your solution. They're sort of all sort of plug and play, ready to go, and uh, they're sort of all optimized with a number of uh, sort of connections to various CDNs and services already sort of wired into them. So again, these are great sort of starter kit ways of of looking at it and. You know, it, the, uh, it says here they, they tend to start under 5000 I think, you know, looking across the board as you start price comparison, you'll, you'll see that the prices do tend to vary from uh, just a little under five grand to, you know, somewhere uh, slightly above that. You know, I think if you really wanted to deck one of these out, I, again, I think the even the most expensive ones I've, I've seen tend to be about ten grand at the most. What's great about these is it's uh, really set up for those multi-camera solutions. So the with that Matrox card in place, you I think it gives you sort of a max of four inputs uh, right out of the gate. Uh, so it gives you sort of a, a nice quick way for that multi-cam solution of, of putting together um, a pretty sophisticated program pretty quick. Uh, and so sort of in closing, uh, just some of the other uh, parting thoughts I wanted to make sure that, that you guys had covered. Um, I, I kind of said this a couple different ways, but I just wanted to make sure I, I re reiterate it. Know your strengths when you're doing uh, uh, a live stream. You're coming into this with, with you know, you got into this for some sort of reason, and, and you want to focus on the, the talents that you have, and you want to kind of outsource the rest. So if, if you're really good at setting up streaming servers, by all means, you know, go go buy and create your own system from scratch. If you if you know how to build a, a encoder from the ground up, go get the software and, and rig out your own system with capture cards and everything else. But if you're really more of a production person who just needs to happen to broadcast that out to the uh, uh, to the internet, then then by all means look for the turnkey solutions and look for the video streaming services that are out there because there's there's really a wealth of them. I mean, there's so many more than there were even just three or four years ago. Take advantage of those uh, because you're ultimately going to save money and time by spending money more effectively with those type solutions. Uh, one of the things, one of the places where I've seen live uh, streaming events fall down is just not having uh, not having enough uh, hands available for production. Make sure you've got plenty of people around uh, to help literally do, you know, holding the mics, making sure that your, your production is there. Uh, trying to pull these things off with with too few people uh, just mean, ends up that means that you have a lot of stressed people trying to get things done. Always do lots of planning. You don't want the first time, the event, to be the first time you've tried to put everything together. You want to run fire drills and you want to do full production run-throughs on, on everything that you can. Again, I, I said this one several times, but I, I can't say it enough. You don't want to exceed your, your broadcast bandwidth. So whatever your upload is, don't don't ever go really above the 50% mark on that. Otherwise, you're just going to start seeing uh, inability to stay reliably connected. Uh, redundancy. Make sure that you've got backups across the board. Make sure that you know what happens if your encoder fails, how you reboot and get it restarted. Uh, have backup if you're you know if this is really a high end production you're trying to put together. Make sure you've got uh, multiple ways to connect to your 
uh, to your streaming service. Uh, make sure you have multiple publish points there. And then be capturing it locally as well. Um, I can't tell you how critical it is, how you know something happens live and you wish you had captured it and for some reason you, you didn't have it running. You, you want to be recording it locally as well because you're going to want to either offer that uh, as part of your business model, um, but you may just want to go capture segments of that to, to use again for, for some other purpose. And the last piece is, you know, in this industry, we really uh, measure our specs in, in terms of months. Uh, bandwidth, bandwidth requirements, the gear that we're, we're doing all of these uh, uh, events with, and then the consumer devices that people are watching them on themselves, they all change out uh, specs about every 12 to 18 months. So the reality is, whatever, whatever I'm telling you today, that's going to be different a year and a half from now. Um, by then, hopefully, we've all got awesome rocket ships that stream 4K content to our handheld devices. Um, hopefully that's the case, but if it's not, you know, there's going to be a new set of, of uh, specifications out there and you want to make sure that you're using the, the best encoder settings and the best, uh, uh, the best practices to get to those various devices. So you constantly be in a state of evaluating and testing to make sure that the, the settings and the workflow you're using are still right, uh, even if you've done this a million times. Andy, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And um, yeah, no, no, great, great job. We do have a lot of questions for you. So if you're ready, we'll get started. Fire away. All right, let's see. The first question is, can you explain the difference between the terms encoding and transcoding? Uh, sure, they, they could almost be used interchangeably. Transcoding is, is technically where you're taking an existing IP stream and, and encoding it again into something else. So some of that sort of cloud-based encoding I talked about, cloud-based encoding is really transcoding because you're taking an existing IP stream and you're turning it into some other version format uh, or data bit rate of, of the encode. Uh, a true encode uh, by sort of industry standards would be taking a baseband signal or some sort of uh, analog video. So taking the camera feed or a VTR tape or something else and running it down a cable into a capture card and actually turning it into some sort of digital uh, feed for encoding. I see. Cool. How do you determine what type of streaming to use, HTTP streaming versus RTMP streaming? Uh, it, it really comes down to your audience. Uh, you know, if you're, if you've got a lot of people who are connecting on what we sort of call the, the multi devices, meaning uh, iOS, uh, you know, iPads, iPhones, Android devices, uh, s some of the set top boxes, then you probably want to be using uh, some sort of HTTP um, live streaming or adaptive bitrate streaming. Um, but if you're more focused on an audience that is truly just watching off of laptops, then you could probably do RTMP streaming uh, or, or flash-based streaming. You know, that said, again, because of the, the way that our, we've moved in architecture where we sort of have two points of encode, your, your, uh, your event site where you're doing an encode and the cloud, you, could, you can have a scenario where you're doing sort of RTMP locally to deliver to the cloud, and then at, at a cloud level, it's being re-encoded or repackaged into the, the HTTP streaming. So, you know, it's it's probably more a matter of uh, deciding, you know, which platform uh, at the cloud level you're you're going to support to make sure you can kind of do both. I see. Cool. Um, what about nineteen twenty by ten eighty streaming? Is anybody doing that? Um. For on-demand streaming, there there's certainly a lot of places that are experimenting with 1080. I, I haven't seen a lot of uh, people outside of, I think the only events that I can think of that were, were done in live streaming have been sort of major events like the Super Bowl and uh, the Olympics. Uh, beyond that, I haven't seen a lot of truly uh, sort of uh, 1080p HD streaming that's been done. Yeah, because that would take a lot of bandwidth, right? It takes a lot of bandwidth, and it's a you're just you're there are a lot of points of failure, <laughs> basically. Right. Uh, and so it's uh, it tends to be sort of where the stakes are high, but then you're putting a lot of production money behind it as well to make sure you're you you, you have that in place. So, yeah, 720p has become very common, and we we are seeing more and more of that. Uh, 
1080p, you know, we'll probably see that pick up more over the next sort of two ish years. Yeah, somebody's saying that Ustream offers 1080 streaming. Just because they're offered doesn't mean it's reliable or, or you know. And, it's and true. a lot of depends, and, I would say, on your end, right? As well. Exactly. I mean, it, it's all down to what you can deliver. And, and again, for, for to do a 1080p stream, I really, uh, you know, I, I would want like a dedicated sort of 10 meg uh, connection at minimum to, to the internet right. Uh, right. for that delivery. And just to even remotely get close. And I still don't think that would be the greatest quality 1080p stream either. Yeah, yeah. Here's an interesting question, which um, I'm sure we're not doing today, but I want to ask, is this, I, I never thought about this, but are there any software hardware that will allow streaming in 5.1 surround? That's interesting. Uh, for I mean, live you would streaming, have to start from a source um, with that. Sure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you would, you would have to have a source set up for it. Um, but, but yeah, there, there are some solutions, particularly in that sort of appliance realm that I talked about, that do um, that do 5.1 uh, audio. Um, but that tends to be more of something for the live linear, where you've got a packaged piece of on-demand content that you just happen to be live streaming. Right. Um, so I haven't seen a, a, a whole ton of live streaming events I can think of that, that are uh, put out in 5.1. But yeah, technically right. it's possible. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see. What type of hardware is needed for on-premise streaming? Uh, so by on-premise, are they talking about just streaming around a local network, you mean, you think? I'm thinking that's exactly what it is, right. Right. So, I mean, what, what's actually great about that is that you're not really worried about that, that point of connectivity out to the cloud because you're, you're staying on your local network. So... So you can actually uh, create a much higher bitrate stream to deliver around. You just you know because you're only doing it over your local network. So technically, the same kind of hardware that we're talking about for the um, uh, for delivering a live event uh, out to the broader internet, but in a way you could actually get away with even sort of a uh, a smaller processor because you're not having to do as good a job encoding it. In other words, you know uh, you, you really need a really big processor to really crunch and encode the content down to a decent file size when you're delivering out to the internet. If you're just shuttling it around a, a LAN, you don't necessarily have to be as aggressive about the encoding, meaning you don't necessarily need as as heavy a processor uh, focused and, and devoted on that. So for sort of LAN solutions, you could probably actually get away with a, a lighter processor in your, in your PC or Mac doing the encoding. Very cool. Um, what about streaming using HTML5? Good question. Um, I mean, there's a you know there's there's several solutions out there. Again, probably more in the video services realm already that that have some sort of uh, HTML5. Uh, it tends to be slightly more limited. Uh, all, all of the well, let me take a step back. All of the HTML5 I've seen so far are focused around adaptive bitrate streaming, but they also are um, they're only really, uh, they're good for live streams that don't have things like DRM encryption or uh, some of the sophisticated sort of ad insertion because that technology just doesn't exist on the HTML5 yet, uh, spec yet, uh, as, as sort of how we do it. So it tends to limit when and where you use it. It might be good for smaller events. Uh, it may not be as good for larger audience uh, events. Um, but there, there are some some solutions. I, I know. I think uh, the Justin TV and uh, UStream both had some some HTML5 they were playing with. Yeah. Um, here's an interesting one. That's sort of a religious war, but not really. I mean, people really want to know: Is Mac or PC for streaming? Why? You know, it. it yeah. You know, once upon a time, I would have said I was very much a Mac person, and uh, you know, I'm sure people noticed I was delivering from a PC today. It almost doesn't matter to me uh, the, the the device. Uh, if it's a sort of purpose-built, dedicated system, I tend to go PC these days because they're they're cheaper, and and you know, I'd rather have three PCs set up for redundancy than a single Mac. But if I'm in an environment where I'm doing a lot of video editing and encoding and other things, then I tend to be on a Mac. 
Uh, so it's really down to, you know, again, it's one of those things of where you invest the money. Um, you know, I'd, I'd probably, uh, for, for general live streaming, I'd probably go with a couple PCs uh, because I can get several of them uh, and then invest that extra money I had left over on, on getting a slightly better camera um, than, than going the Mac route. But I, I love my Macs too, so I, I, I have you know a Mac laptop, and I tend to use it just as much if I'm, uh, particularly not for live streaming, but for for post production type work, I, I tend to still be pretty Mac centric. Right, right, right. But today, really, there's no difference between Mac and PC from a functionality I, or performance perspective. Yeah, honestly, not. I mean, they're they're super similar. Um, you know, the high end Macs that that you can get now are are killer machines, but uh, at Similar or slightly cheaper price points, you can get just about the exact same spec. So it really is down to just which UI you prefer to use. Right, right, definitely. Uh, final question, because we're pretty much out of time. What about Flash? What's happening with Flash and streaming? When, what do you see in the future? Yeah, no, I mean they're you know they're still totally viable in the market. I mean the uh, you know most of the. Uh, Used to be that you know ninety or percent or more of the, the content we saw was flash based. Uh, it's it's not the case anymore. There's a lot more sort of uh, of these HTTP HLS or adaptive bitrate streams that are that are out there. But several of those are still powered on the back end by flash in in some way. So flash and Adobe in general is is doing a pretty good job of sort of reinventing itself into this more modern age of of how we uh, how we do encoding. They're a little less focused on uh, sort of the some of the video player experience and a little more on the infrastructure side. So they have some really cool solutions around how you uh, authenticate or how you do the ad insertions or how you do encryption or uh, rights accesses and other things. So uh, still totally viable, still very useful, um, but it's not necessarily the um, it's not exactly the the solution that we had like five years ago. Flash that we have today is, I think, a very different beast from the video side than it, than it was. Uh, uh, but it's, you know, it's changing and that that's totally for the best, believe me. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Well, Andy, um, I do want to thank you for presenting today. It's been um, a pleasure working with you as always. So thank you so much uh, for doing this. Yeah, absolutely, Marcelo. Thanks again. I also would like to thank Telestream for sponsoring our show and for providing such great prizes to give away. Last but definitely not least, I would like to thank each and every one of you for attending our show. I sincerely hope you enjoyed it. So until our next show, I am your host, Marcelo Lewin. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.